The first 10 minutes were not recorded, setting the motivation and the context for the text. In lieu of those minutes, Dr. Burson's notes on the history are included here. Background and History of the Text by Dr. Alexander Burson this text is in the Lojong tradition of mind training and was written by the Indian master Dharmarakshita at the end of the 10th century, beginning of the 11th century. He was one of the teachers of Atisha, who had in all 157 teachers. Often people have confusion about how to deal with having multiple teachers. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has said to imagine them like 11 face thousand armed Avalokiteshvara. They are like different faces on one figure and they all fit together in a very harmonious and integrated way. That's very helpful. Atisha was a great Indian master who traveled to Sumatra in Indonesia, specifically to receive a special lineage of the mind training teachings. He returned to India and was then invited to Tibet. He was the person who began the second transmission of Dharma from India into Tibet after its decline at the end of the first transmission from which the Nyingma teachings derive. No original Sanskrit version of the text is available. In the colophon at the end of the Tibetan version, none of the translators are listed. This is odd. The usual custom with Tibetan translations of Indian texts is to give the Sanskrit title at the beginning and the name of the translators at the end. In this case, the Tibetan text just says that it was passed from Atisha to Dom Trumpa, his Tibetan disciple, and then it continued to list the lineage after that. My suspicion is that it was just received orally from Dhammarakshita to Atisha, and it was actually written down in Tibet later, perhaps by Dom Trumpa or somebody after that. This is also confirmed by the fact that the language and style of the text is purely Tibetan, and not at all the style found in texts translated from Sanskrit. In any case, according to Dom Trumpa, Atisha had three teachers of Bodhicitta, two in India, Dhammarakshita and Mitra Yogi, and one in Sumatra, Sir Lingpa, his teacher from the Golden Island, the name of Sumatra at that time. According to tradition, Dhammarakshita had such great compassion that he cut off a piece of flesh from his leg to give to a sick man as a type of medicine. Maitri Yogi was so advanced in his practice of Tonglen, giving your own happiness to others and taking on their suffering, that he developed a bruise on his own leg when a dog was being beaten. He was able to take that injury on himself. But Atisha said that the main source of the mind training teachings was Sir Lingpa. At that time, and for many centuries before that, there was a great deal of sea trade between India and Indonesia, specifically Sumatra. A great Buddhist kingdom flourished there at that time. Recently, they have found the ruins of the monastic institution in Sumatra, where presumably Sir Lingpa taught and Atisha attended. It was an enormous center of learning larger even than Nalanda University. There's been very little research done on Indonesian Buddhism, actually, but they translated a great many texts into old Javanese. They had this great center of learning, and Sir Lingpa was a great master from this monastic university. The present site is called Maurajambi, and the people there are trying to get it recognized as a World Heritage Site to help with more archaeological excavations of this discovery. Although Atisha said that the main source of the mind training teachings was in Sumatra, from Sir Lingpa, my theory is that prior to his journey there, he had received some similar teachings, like this particular text of Wheel of Sharp Weapons, and his second text by Dhammarakshita entitled A Peacock's Destruction of Poison. These texts teach a great deal in common with the mind training teachings, and therefore my theory is that Atisha wanted to learn more about that having been introduced to these teachings in India. To accomplish that, he needed to go to Sumatra and thereby bring them back in full to India and then later transmit them to Tibet. The question really concerns whether this text is part of the mind trading tradition or a forerunner. How do we actually consider it? If we look at the 14th century collection of mind training texts, hundreds of mind trainings, it includes two of Dharmarakshita's texts. In some editions, it even adds onto the title a Mahayana mind training, Wheel of Sharp Weapons, which is not part of the title that Dharmarakshita himself gave to the text. 
The text has many aspects in common with the mind training teachings, particularly the practice of Tonglen, giving and taking, and accepting the defeat on yourself and giving the victory to others. The source of both of these two teachings is Nagarjuna's text, A Precious Garland, where it says, May all their negative potentials ripen on me, and may all my constructive potentials ripen on them. Shantideva, in engaging in bodhisattva behavior, also teaches the giving and taking practice in the dedication prayer at the end of his text where he writes, Whatever suffering wandering beings have, may all of them ripen on me, and through the bodhisattva assembly may wandering beings enjoy happiness. This tradition of giving and taking, with its long history in India, was elaborated on by Dharmarakshita, with the emphasis in his text on the disadvantages of self-cherishing. Such a self-centered attitude prevents us from being able to actually take on the sufferings of others with compassion and give them happiness with love. Love and compassion are the basis for the development of bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is our mind being aimed at our own individual enlightenment, which have not yet happened, but which can happen on the basis of our Buddha nature factors. It is accompanied by the intention to achieve that enlightenment and to benefit all beings by means of that attainment. Specifically, bodhicitta is aimed at the dharmakaya aspect of our not-yet-happening enlightenments. There are two stages, conventional and deepest bodhicitta. Conventional bodhicitta is aimed at the deep awareness dharmakaya aspect, in other words, the enlightened mind of omniscience, with its conventional nature of being able to give rise to the form bodies of a Buddha, the appearance of a Buddha. Deepest bodhicitta is aimed at the svavavikakaya, the essential nature dharmakaya, namely the voidness or emptiness of the enlightened mind and the true stoppings in it. Deepest bodhicitta is often called ultimate bodhicitta. Conventional bodhicitta is sometimes called relative bodhicitta. True stoppings are often called true cessations. Okay, so, so just to kind of go back again, Self-grasping, ignorance in this context, there are a lot of types of self-grasping, but, but the self-grasping that we're talking about here, viewing the I in your own mental continuum, holding it to exist inherently, that root of samsara is the main issue. Because of that, you have self-cherishing. So a Hinayana Arhat or a foundational vehicle Arhat who's completed their path and who has achieved Nirvana doesn't have self-grasping anymore but they still have subtle self-cherishing. Yeah, they still have a little bit of self-cherishing, which is um, preventing their full enlightenment, their full Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. They are not completely omniscient. They're not completely able to see the minds and the needs of others or the whole spectrum of their karma. So um, it's, it's like that's what allows them to abide in the extreme of peace. Yeah, the, the subtle self-cherishing that they have in their continuum allows them to abide in the extreme of peace and not work for the welfare of all sentient beings. But it should be noted that these Hinayana Arhats or these um, foundational vehicle Arhats are incredibly powerful, compassionate beings who would never harm anyone intentionally. Right? They would never harm anyone. They're completely staying out of trouble. Right? They're just abiding in nirvana, minding their own business. They're just not proactively seeking to work for the welfare of others. Does that make sense? So, so they're incredibly compassionate, comp incredibly loving, but they're not um, taking that personal responsibility. Yeah. So when we talk about self-cherishing, there's a self-cherishing that's a little bit more passive, that's not causing as much trouble which is just, you know, you need to look after yourself. That's important. That's positive self-cherishing. Because if you don't look after yourself, you become a burden to other people who then have to look after you, right? If you think I need to get rid of all my self-cherishing so I need to get rid of all of my belongings, that's not wise, is it? And you become someone who is uh, martyred and um, ineffective. So, really understanding that there's a, a kind of a normal, healthy, functional version of self-cherishing that's okay to keep, and we should keep for now. And slowly, slowly, we let go of that as well. The problem we're talking about here is the negative self-cherishing, which is like the slave of self-grasping at this point. Yeah. 
because of our self grasping, then it just seems only natural to think me first, me first. And kind of the more depressed or angry you get, the more self cherishing has taken over the mind. There's a direct correlation to your everyday suffering and how much self cherishing is driving you. So it's so difficult because when you're in a terrible mood to think the reason I'm in a terrible mood is because I'm thinking of myself. No, I'm hating myself. I'm putting myself down. I'm thinking I'm terrible, but I is the main conversation in your head, right? I, 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 you become in this like echo chamber of crazy. Yeah. And so you're not doing anyone any good and incredibly miserable. You know, do you know this place? right? Where it feel, you feel terrible. You're just in a horrible mood, um, angry and irritable or sad or melancholy or heavy, heavy depression, whatever it is. It doesn't feel like self-cherishing, but it is self-cherishing because it's self-obsession and it's a, a self-consciousness and a, you know, kind of a hyper um, self-awareness but not real self-awareness that's observing the mind with mindfulness. It's self-awareness that's completely fragile. So this is the enemy that we're talking about in this text. So if you want to look at um, starting at the beginning, <clears throat> and um, do you have any questions about Dharma Rakshita before we start? The author, one of the main teachers of Atisha, somewhere between the 9th century and the 11th century, yeah, general, yeah, you're, you get the link though that he's one of the teachers of Atisha. Atisha was one of the main uh, organizers of Lam Rim. Lam Rim is Lama Tsongkhapa, great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, kind of our um, Galukpa holy grail that we rely on. Yeah. Okay, so it's that kind of link. So it says, the name of this work, The Wheel of Sharp Weapons, Effectively Striking the Heart of the Foe. I pay heartfelt homage to you, Yamantaka, your wrath is opposed to the great Lord of death. Okay, so this first little bit has a little bit to unpack. A lot of the verses are very straightforward and you'll understand them right away. They're just like, oh no. Um, but this one needs a little bit of unpacking. So first, why do you think we take homage? Yeah, never mind who we're taking homage in and for and to and who Yamantaka is. What is a homage? What? Pay respect to someone and uh, reduce your ego at the same time because you're looking up to someone, you know? Yeah. You appreciate what they've done, uh, you know, in order to make you understand sometimes the work, the example they give. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's this premise that we see again and again that you become receptive to what you respect. You become receptive to what you respect. And so by reminding yourself that you respect the teachings or the representation of the teachings, you open back up to listening deeply and wanting to embody those for yourself. So the reason it comes at the beginning of a text so often, there's a lot of reasons. One is to indicate which category of teachings it belongs to. Another is to clear any obstacles for the composer um, to complete um, the text. So if you start with a homage, it sort of helps clear the obstacles to finishing the text. So it's a normal reason for a homage, as well as these extra reasons. Um, we're talking about Yamantaka, which is not usual in a text. Often you'll see homage to Manjushri, homage to Great Compassion, homage to Chenrezig, you know, you'll see that homage a lot. But here we have Yamantaka, and Yamantaka is the wrathful emanation of Manjushri, the one with the flaming sword. So it's indicating to us this, despite it being a very bodhicitta text, it's still really aiming at wisdom. Does that make sense? So Yamantaka is the wrathful form of Manjushri. What does that mean? The wrathful form. So you've got, you know, Manjushri seems wrathful enough. He's got a flaming sword. It seems like, you know, <laughs> is that not enough? Um, and, you know, the man that we are so used to seeing, his flaming sword, of course, is cutting through ignorance, right? Using the sword of wisdom to cut through ignorance. We're used to this kind of iconography. Yamataka is the highest yoga tantra version of the same energy. 
And so if you were to see a picture of Yamantaka, it's very full on and it, it's, uh, you know, it's something that you might see in an art museum or something, or you might see um, in a Tibetan gompa that hasn't hidden their highest yoga tantra deities away in a protector room. You might come across a Yamantaka, maybe, but um, Yamantaka is very, very wrathful looking in the fact that he has many weapons, not just a sword. He's carrying, it just is a crazy image, okay? And uh, he's got a buffalo face and, you know, dripping blood, many faces. Um, you know, it's just, it's a full on image on purpose, on purpose. So when we see these wrathful deities in Tantra, we're not thinking, oh, suddenly Buddhists have changed their mind and decided that violence is a good idea, right? It's not like we suddenly changed our mind. It was like, never mind compassion, let's blow up the world. Here's a number of weapons, proceed. You know, that's not at all what is meant. Um, just like when you see deities in union like Vajrasattva and the Wisdom Mother, it's not indicating some like orgy workshop out the back or something. There's not, you know, <laughs> that's not what it's indicating. That is what it looks like. And normally we wouldn't talk about this kind of stuff in a general audience with people that don't all have highest yoga tantra empowerment. But because in the modern age, these things are so Googleable, <laughs> they're so easily accessed. Um, just because they are easy to access, um, it's good to explain them a little bit so we don't develop wrong views if we come across them. And as Dharma practitioners, we don't want to, you know, continue this degeneration by putting images out there in the wrong place. So even though there's a million pictures of Yamantaka on the internet, we don't want to add ours, <laughs> right? But the fact that they're out there, it's good to explain them and kind of unpack it a little bit. So when you meet them, you don't get confused. I think a lot of you are um, highest yoga tantra practitioners or have come across these images before. But just so you know, the wrath is intentional because it's an intimidating figure to intimidate negative states of mind. Yeah, so you're not in, it's not um, an aspect to intimidate others. It's not, oh, I'm going to intimidate others by um, developing this really scary version of myself and I'm going to overpower them and dominate them in this worldly, yucky way. What it's saying is that there is a time and a place to use your energy to subdue the negative states of minds of others, completely filled with love and compassion. Yeah, completely filled with love and compassion. For us at our level, it probably comes out most naturally with maybe children or with animals where because we care about them and we want to protect them and we don't want them to hurt themselves, sometimes we might adopt a more fierce aspect um, to quickly take them from danger. You know, if the child is about to reach into the fire, you're not going to say, oh, darling, we don't touch fire. You're not going to say it sweetly, right? You're just going to grab them and take them out of the fire. You know, it's not going to be like a sweet diplomatic conversation. It's going to be quick and it's going to be forceful, but it's completely loving and compassionate. So this is indicating right off the bat that this text is hardcore. <laughs> Okay, we're not doing normal Manjushri wisdom, we're doing Yamantaka wisdom, because we're looking at how much karma has uh, interfered with our happiness and how much that karma came from the self-cherishing thought, which is the demon ruining the joy of our life. So let's stop tiptoeing around the fact that life is really hard because of self-cherishing. We're not going to tiptoe around it and be gentle about it and water it down anymore. We're going to go straight to the heart of it and destroy it. And there's a lot of um, quite violent sounding words within this very poetic, beautiful text. And it can kind of be off-putting, especially if um, you're seeking Dharma practice because of its peaceful nature, because of how gentle and compassionate and beautiful it is. You can come across some of the words in this text and be quite triggered, like, this isn't the Dharma that I know and love. But what it's saying is that now that you're on board, let's take it really seriously. Now that you're on board, let's take it really seriously. And we're not enacting violence on anything. We're not enacting violence on anything that will be harmed except for the negative states of mind, which have been the problem the whole time.
So this text is really appropriate in this day and age, um, always has been, but particularly now. Um, one of the most common questions is how do you practice Dharma in daily life, right? How do you practice Dharma with a normal worldly life, a normal family life? How do you practice if you're not a monk or a nun, or you can't go to retreat, or if you're married, or et cetera, et cetera? And this text is basically saying you have everything you need. Okay. So um, I pay homage, I pay a heartfelt homage to you, Yamantaka. Your wrath is opposed to the great Lord of Death. So the Lord of Death is Yama who we talked about last time when we did the 12 links. Yama, the Lord of Death, which is karma and disturbing emotions, or uncontrolled death. Yama is the fact that um, our death is out of our control. Our death is controlled by karma and disturbing emotions. So Yamantaka is the slayer of the Lord of Death. You with me so far? So the slayer of the Lord of Death is what we're paying homage to, but the ultimate Yamantaka that we're talking about is the wisdom realizing emptiness. So there's this outer aspect which is wrathful and scary and monstrous, even more monstrous than the scary monster Yama, to intimidate Yama, right? That's the outer appearance, that's the iconography, but really what we're talking about is you need the wisdom realizing emptiness to stop uncontrolled death as well as to stop samsara altogether. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So the first verse after the homage says, in jungles of poisonous plants strut the peacocks, though medicine gardens of beauty lie near. The masses of peacocks don't find gardens pleasant, but strive on the essence of poisonous plants. Verse two, in similar fashion, the brave bodhisattvas remain in the jungle of worldly concern. No matter how joyful this world's pleasure gardens, these brave ones are never attracted to pleasures, but thrive in the jungle of suffering and pain. Okay, so what we're, we're, we're introducing here in the text is the analogy that will go throughout the whole text, which is peacocks are bodhisattvas in this text. There are five points of similarity between bodhisattvas and peacocks. Just as the colors of the peacock's feathers grow more radiantly brilliant when they eat plants that are poisonous to other animals, bodhisattvas shine with blissful happiness by making use of such poisonous delusions as desire and attachment for the benefit of others. Just as peacocks have five crowned feathers, bodhisattvas have the attainment to the five graded paths for enlightenment. Just as the sight of a peacock's colorful display gives us great pleasure, the sight of a bodhisattva uplifts our mind because of his bodhicitta. Just as peacocks live mostly on poisonous plants and never eat insects or cause others harm, bodhisattvas never cause even the slightest harm to other sentient beings. Just as peacocks eat poisonous plants with pleasure, when bodhisattvas are offered sensory objects, although they have no attachment to these objects, they accept them with pleasure and allow the donor to gain merit from their offering. Um, crows will come up soon. Crows are ordinary people like us who haven't tamed their mind. The beautiful gardens are like the pleasures of samsara. And the poisonous food is all of the hardships of samsara. So it's said that uh, peacocks can eat food that other birds find poisonous and that when they eat this food, it makes their colors more beautiful. Now, I, of course, I had to Google this and see if that was actually the case. <laughs> and it turns out there's some, there's some conversation about whether or not this is actually the case that peacocks can eat poison and it makes their colors more beautiful. Put a pit in that, sit with the poetry. Okay, so the poetry of it is that uh, things that most birds would find poisonous, they use to make them more and more and more beautiful. So for most people, the hardships of samsara make them downtrodden. You know, the difficulties of samsara make them suffer and heavy and obstacles. And everything feels like an obstacle to their path. For bodhisattvas, those exact same hardships become fuel for their path. 
that makes them stronger and stronger and more beautiful in their practice. So that's kind of the baseline of the analogy. And so what they're saying is that you don't need to change the outer aspect of your life. There might be some activities you do a little less of, there might be some things that you sort of slow down, but generally speaking, you can live a very ordinary life and have an extraordinary practice, an extraordinary practice. So if you can kind of, um, I don't know, you can be really American about it and think to yourself, be the peacock, be the peacock, you know? <laughs> but really what they're saying is that um, right now, we're so tempted by the pleasure gardens, meaning we're so tempted by the samsara because it's all we've ever known. Yeah, it's all we've ever known. And so instead of doing practice, we go to the pleasures of samsara because they have a degree of reliability for us in that we're used to them. So even though they don't work perfectly and even though they're temporary, it's, it's one of these things where it's it's like it's good enough because we don't really know if there's anything better and to work for something better it might I don't know if it doesn't work then there'll be a big cost and then we won't have anything you know we have a lot of interesting ways of, of processing the quote sacrifice of samsaric pleasures for the great bliss of nirvana and buddhahood you know, so it's like we want nirvana and Buddhahood, we want complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, but the way to get there feels like it's going to involve a sacrifice of what we've always known. Feels like we have to give up our home. Feels like we have to give up our friends and our worldly comforts. That's what it feels like. And so we're kind of living in this in-between state, right? In this limbo, in this bardo, where we so much want to practice the path. We really want to practice the path. And we're willing to do a certain degree of, you know, adding to our kindness, adding to our compassion, being good neighbors, being good citizens. And at the same time, not really cutting the root of samsara, not really cutting our attachment. So we're just kind of softening the edges of samsara to make it a bit more bearable, but in no way we're getting out of it. This is what we normally do. And so it takes a little bit of a leap of faith, but not a blind faith. It's a faith based in experience where you realize that when you've caught yourself going for the samsaric pleasure once again, whatever it is, and you've kind of released your attachment to it, there's a moment of discomfort and fear which then opens up into freedom. Just, a, you know, a momentary freedom, not a lasting freedom, but to remember the friction point, the transition point between old habit and new habit is uncomfortable. And then it's not. It's not like you have to wait to be enlightened to feel the pleasure of practice, right? The pleasure of practice is accessible to us every session, but it's like there's this moment of truth all the time of, do the old habit, try the new thing. Do the old habit, try the new thing. And what we usually do is resolve it by kind of doing half of each. Yeah? Do you know what I mean? So you're, you, you, know, you think, all right, I'm not going to um, yell at my kids today, but I'll yell at my husband. <laughs> You know, or I'm not going to um, watch so much TV today, but I am going to read that novel. But it's a good novel. It's historical. It's fine. I'm allowed. You know, and we do these kind of weird justifications in our mind and just kind of like dance around trying to feel soothed that we're still a good person and still a Dharma practitioner, even though we haven't really given up anything about samsara. Yeah. We're actually fully invested in samsara and most of the day is reinforcing samsara. Um, but we don't want to feel like we're a bad person. And so we do these weird dances in our head about why it's okay. Yeah. And so it takes so much, I don't know, awareness of how you are not your afflictions to adopt the worldview presented in this text. Because otherwise it feels like an act of self-harm. Yeah. So when you read this text, you know, slay them and trample them and destroy them and blah, 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 talking about the afflictions, talking about self-cherishing, talking about the root of samsara, you cannot take it as I am bad and should be punished. There's not, 
this whole background connotation that we normally have with these ideas. You are not a sinner and you do not need to repent, <laughs> okay? You have negative habits born from ignorance that are not so useful, so let's try and stop. You know, like really clean it up, like, you know, all your family of origin issues, all of your conditioning, try and just kind of give it some breathing room and try not to be too reactive to the text and just kind of take it fresh and ask yourself, oh, right, Buddhists don't look at afflictions the same way as the way we talk about them in the world. They are not your fault, they are just your responsibility. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Okay, so then when you're starting to look at, okay, so how am I gonna be the peacock in the poison grove? Which is, um, you know, one of the best uh, commentaries on this text, um, which some of you might have, is this book by um, Geshe Zopa, The Peacock in the Poison Grove, is um, a commentary to this text, and another one that's similar. But you ask yourself, how am I gonna be the peacock in the poison grove and use everything to make me stronger? You have to start with a conviction that you can progress. Yeah, so, so you have to sit with, all right, there's my expectations of how I think I should progress, and that's a whole mess. I don't need to really actually look at that because it's caused nothing but trouble. All my expectations about what I think my path should be by now. You know, and most of us have been studying Dharma for more than five years, more than 10 years, more than 20 years. You know, we've been studying this a long time. And so then you can start to think, I should be better than this by now. I should be getting better. And sometimes it even feels like you're getting worse, but you know, it's just your self-awareness is more activated, so you notice. Yeah, but so if you can just sit with, is change possible? Never mind what I thought the change should look like. Just comparing myself to two years ago, just two years ago, is there something in my mind less likely to believe my own projections? If I have a mood come up, am I less likely to just fall right into it, invest all my attention in it, believe it, invest it, hunker down and see it as truth? Or is there a tiny bit more space to go, just because I feel it might not mean it's true. <laughs> just a little tiny crack, right? And I think there is for all of us, a tiny little crack more than used to be where we don't necessarily believe our own stories quite so much or quite so often. And it seems so small and it's embarrassing to name the progress you've had on the path so far because it seems so tiny compared to what you thought you'd be able to do by now. But we don't know all of the eons of habits from previous lives, you know, all the lifetime and lifetimes we've had that we haven't even met a path, let alone tried to practice it. The fact that there's even a crack to consider what I project might be, not be true is really amazing. It's so amazing. And so, you know, you kind of sit with that and think, that is a skill that I developed over time and thought, I can do this. It's just going to take longer than my ego thinks because my ego has co-opted my spiritual path already. It's made it its own. It's decided that I'm a grand Dharma practitioner. I'm different than the rest of society. I live different than the rest of society. And then you realize that you don't, <laughs> you know, and then there's all sorts of self-hatred and defensiveness or disassociation, depending on your style of affliction, right? So if you don't live up to your own expectations of your spiritual path, then there's a whole extra problem. Yeah, so to have this conviction that you can be the peacock in the poison grove, just start by looking at what is the poison you already use and use it to make yourself stronger and more beautiful. What are the difficulties in your life that you have already taken on the path, even if they're so tiny? You know, even if it's just something like, I don't know, the neighbor always parks in your parking spot and five years ago that would have driven you crazy and now you just politely ask them to move that is worth celebrating because it's just one moment less conflict in this world, we should throw a parade. Do you know what I mean? So, so really to start where you are takes this tremendous humility combined with tremendous confidence. 
that confidence and humility have to be our best friends, where it's totally different to pride, which holds yourself up to this impossible standard that you occasionally approach every once in a while on a good day and thinks of that as you, but secretly knows you're not. And then there's all sorts of trips and stories and weirdness in your head about it. Instead of doing that, you're having this humility that realizes, I have no idea what I'm doing most of the time, but sometimes I do. <laughs> Sometimes I do, just sometimes. And those sometimes I am so happy and I'm so much more kind than I used to be. You know, those little moments of sometimes where the, co the conditions come together and my mind is focused enough, such joy, just such joy and such ease with kindness to, towards others in those little moments. It's so easy to be compassionate when you're happy, isn't it? When you're happy, compassion just flows as opposed to like excited attachment, happy, not that one, but, you know, the deep contentment of the spiritual path. And so you take this like, okay, this is going to take a bit longer than I thought, but I could enjoy it all the way along. I don't have to wait for enjoyment of the path, you know, and I also don't have to push myself with this horrible striving that says, become enlightened in this life like Milarepa, you fool, how dare you not be enlightened already? You're a smart person, you should already understand this. You know, all these kind of inner critics and inner saboteurs and, you know, could have, would have, should have, it's really not healthy. And in a way, if you beat yourself up enough, it's like you have permission not to try. As if beating yourself up is the price you pay to not have to work at your path. It's a bizarre way of thinking, but I hear it so many times in uh, people discussing their path and their practice, and I hear it in my own head, where you know it's kind of like, if you're mean to yourself enough, then you're off the hook. Yeah, it's a whole weird guilt thing that we learned from someone somewhere and it seemed like a good idea and now it's just our default, you know? So, so remember that guilt is not a Buddhist thing. Regret is a Buddhist thing and it's healthy and clean healthy and clean. So to be the peacock in the poison grove also means look for other peacocks, the ones that are shinier and more glorious than you and use them as inspiration. Okay, so if you see someone like, um, like His Holiness is the perfect example, isn't he? Where, you know, he was an amazing teacher before he left Tibet, but after he was forced out of Tibet, he became this like amazing everywhere teacher that everyone knows and everyone's inspired by, or most people who meet him anyway. Do you know what I mean? Like he really took the hardship and it made him even more glorious. Now, of course, he was that glorious already. It's a bit like Shakyamuni Buddha showing the aspect of being a prince and giving up his princely life and, you know, living the life of an aesthetic and then having the middle way and et cetera, et cetera. He was a Buddha already, but he was showing the aspect of something that we can aspire to because it's relatable. The story is relatable. So similarly with His Holiness, it's, it's relatable to think, if I lost my homeland, <laughs> If I lost my homeland, if I was in charge of the homeland that I lost, how would I cope? Would I want to go to war? Would I dissolve into seclusion? What would I do? And then you look at His Holiness and you think, that is the best response there could ever be to losing your whole country that you're in charge of. Because now, you know, Buddhism is going everywhere. And the kind of complete form and the enriched form that he teaches is so accessible now. And it's like, that is the way to be the peacock in the poison grove. Could he be the way that he is if he hadn't had so much hardship in his life? You know? And, you know, I was thinking about um, my, my abbot, Kensu Rinpoche, Geshitashi Sering. He, um, he also had to leave Tibet at the same time as His Holiness. And he was in Baksor, the, you know, old kind of uh, retired concentration camp that uh, the Indian government put a lot of the Tibetan refugees into just to give them accommodation. And it was really rough and it was really, um, you know, overcrowded and there was a lot of disease. And, um, and my teacher got tuberculosis, you know, in the lungs. And he thought, oh, this is negative karma ripening. Obviously, I should do more prostrations. 
So, you know, I was thinking about like, I get a little cold and I think, well, that's an excuse to stay in bed all day. I've got a little cold. You know, my teacher thinks I have tuberculosis. I obviously should do hundreds of prostrations. <laughs> I think, wow, someday, someday I'm gonna be like that. <laughs> Not today, but someday. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see that um, his response to hardship is always, this is negative karma ripening. This is negative karma ripening that I created from self-grasping and self-cherishing. He never seems like a victim, right? And he never adopts the attitude of why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? What is wrong with you people? What is wrong with the world? What is wrong with society? Never. You know, it's, oh, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning. Yeah. This is the wheel of sharp weapons returning. And it's not um, oppressive to think that way, it's liberating. Because otherwise you feel like a victim of circumstance. Yeah, if things just feel like they're happening to you all the time, then you kind of start to feel like life is out of control and you have no influence on what happens when. If you realize everything is natural cause and result, you're empowered to take back the reins. So this is the way we want to approach it, right? Not as, here's more ways to look at how I'm bad and wrong. Please don't do that. <laughs> See it as an empowering way of noticing your own hardships as just being the natural result of the energy that came before, that we created in this mental continuum, but we can also release right here in its spot. Okay, so verse three says, we spend our whole lives in search for enjoyment, yet tremble with fear at the mere thought of pain. Thus, since we are cowards, we are miserable still. But the brave bodhisattvas accept suffering gladly and gain from their courage a true lasting joy." Okay, so this is really talking about how self-cherishing keeps us in um, a really small way of thinking. Yeah, it makes us cowardly. We are not cowardly, it makes us cowardly. It's, some, it's an intruder into what could be a very brave mind. And to shift from you know, coward to hero is just a thought you can do in this moment. But you know, to think of yourself as a coward, to be um, under the sway of karma and disturbing emotions and self-cherishing and self-grasping, that is really confronting. You, no one wants to think of themselves as a coward, right? You know, it's just, it's a horrible thought. Our ego hates it. But think of something so simple like when you wake up in the morning and you think, all right, the first thing I need to do is set my motivation. You know, maybe I'll renew my bodhisattva vows or do the refuge prayer or whatever. And then I'll get up and I'll brush my teeth and I'll have a cup of tea and go do my water bowls and do my practice. But first thing in the morning when I wake up, I'm going to do my motivation. Now, some mornings, the self-cherishing mind says, or not sleep in <laughs> or the self-cherishing thought says um why don't you have a nice cozy breakfast first and read the paper at a paper at a leisurely pace and then get to your practice and you forget to motivate maybe and you know it, it's like that doesn't feel like cowardice it feels like just kind of indulgence or it feels like distractedness but what it is, is a type of cowardness of cringing away from the hardship of practice, even though the hardship of practice leads to incredible joy. It's like we can't bear the thought of, you know, what being a little bit hungry for a few more minutes to just sit and do a short little practice before we start the day, which will of course make the day a lot happier and more enriched and more connected. But self-cherishing makes us cringe. It makes you sort of collapse inward and say, no, you know, I'm too little, it's too hard, whatever. There's like, there's something that collapses with self-cherishing that really is a type of cowardice that no one in the world looking at you would say that you're a coward, but it is a type of cowardness. You're not being brave to bear the hardship of also seeing where you actually are. So sometimes with practice, we avoid our practice because we know how much work there is to be done. So when we sit and we do our practice, then we'll actually see our focus isn't as good as we want it to be. 
our bodhicitta doesn't come as naturally as we want it to, et cetera, et cetera. And so sometimes we put off our practice because it's better not to have that proven true. You know, there's a little bit of like push and pull of I want to practice, I'm scared of practice. I want to practice, I'm scared of practice. And we might not even call it scared of practice, but the, it is a type of like, there's a hesitancy to see where you actually are. You don't really want to prove it to yourself how far you have to go. So if you're having kind of like cushion resistance or some kind of, you know, push and pull or argument with your practice, sometimes it is this type of cowardice that really doesn't want to see where you actually are. And so what's the antidote to that <laughs> is confidence and humility, right? Of wherever I'm at is workable. Some days I click right in and it's good old practice and I feel proud of it and I know it could be better, but solid. And some days it's just, wow, I have a lot of work to do. That's a bit embarrassing. But wherever you are is workable. Absolutely wherever you are is workable. And so if you can let your pride settle down, because pride is what makes you a coward. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it, but there's a direct relationship there. Confidence just makes you go, let's just see what happens. Whatever happens is workable. Let's just sit down, do my practice, see what happens. No expectations, no hope, no fear, just let's see. Because the process is worth doing, regardless of the immediate effect. It's a worthwhile thing to be doing. And what builds strength is continuity. Continuity, repetition, learning how to pace yourself. This is the thing. And so, um, don't be mean to yourself by saying you're a coward, but see that self-cherishing is a type of cowardice. Yeah, it stops you from being brave. Yeah, it also can stop you from being brave when you're with other people, can't it? Yeah, when you're with other people and there's a, a moment of truth where you could lift the conversation into something kind of more positive, something more virtuous, something more useful, or you could drop it down into, I don't know, whining about politics or talking about your annoying coworkers or the coronavirus yet again, as if we haven't already covered that ground, you know? So there's like this moment of truth, right? In some conversations where you could be the influencer to lift the conversation and then self-cherishing makes you a bit cowardly and you go, oh, but then they might judge me or maybe they won't go with me there or it's too hard or let's just talk about something safe and easy. Do you know this one? It's totally normal and natural, but, but it is the way self-cherishing makes us a coward, right? We kind of cringe into, oh, I can't say that. Yeah. Thoughts? Is it too hardcore? Are you feeling depressed? Everybody okay? Yeah, <laughs> I love the thumbs up. Yeah. I uh, will say that it's very important to what you said that uh, celebrate the little things. It's, uh, it's like give, uh, I don't know how we say that in, in English, it's like give uh, some, change aspect to our day life that it's usually the default is usually down and when we emphasize empathize the and celebrate the, the even the little thing that we do we we are we are seeing the place of uh, the change that uh, it is a possibility yeah yeah exactly yeah, uh, other, other thoughts about this one? Is anyone feeling reactive or inspired? <laughs> Tom? Very inspired, yeah. I recognize, you know, every sentence you say. But the thing is, you used, and he used, the word uh, cowardness. And I usually relate it to laziness. But, you, you know, it changes my perspective completely. It is cowardness, actually. That's one thing. The other thing you suggested, you know, while in conversation, to lift, you know, the level of conversation. And sometimes when you do, it sounds really condescending. Yeah. Always, so, you know, and that's 
it's cowardice, yes, but then you have the crowd around you that you're talking to and with. So there's a dilemma sometimes. Well, it's skillful means, isn't it? It's skillful means because certainly if you're always trying to bring the conversation to some higher topic, you can sound completely patronizing and condescending, as you said, absolutely. And you become like unbearable to talk to because you will only talk about amazing high spiritual things and you won't just talk about, oh, the grass needs to be cut. Who's going to organize that? You know, you can become unbearable, but it's not so much about the content as about the energy you're bringing to it. You know, this, um, this example I always give of with my grandmother, I always talk about the weather because that makes her happy. <laughs> it makes her happy to talk about the weather. So the content isn't the point so much as finding a point of connection. I could sort of force her to talk about something I find interesting and it would be the same kind of cowardice because it's like, this conversation's not entertaining for me. Let's talk about something I find entertaining, you know? let's talk about something higher because I'm an amazing spiritual being, you know, or something ridiculous like that. Um, so for her and me, talking about the weather is a beautiful way of having a heart connection and touching old memories and touching the times when she was healthier and I was a child and then we had nice moments of sharing and, oh, those flowers are out again. Remember those flowers from that one time we went on that one hike in the woods? That was so lovely. You know, whatever, you know. So, so don't get lost in it thinking that it's always about the content. Yeah, it's about the motivation you're bringing to it. And often our motivation is, I'm going to cringe from something that is going to make me think of more than myself or more than the kind of ordinary vibe of this room you know what's the way to have a heart open experience with who i'm talking to and yeah maybe lift the conversation to better topics or not if it's just not appropriate but you can keep the heart open you know so there's um say the topic is something we're all talking about we're all talking about the coronavirus so there's a way that uh, some people won't be able to shift off that topic if they're talking to you. And you might be like, I know, I've read the same articles, I get it, I don't know, we all know some things, we don't really know everything, I don't know, stop talking about it, <laughs> right? You could do that, or you could think, what is underneath there? Okay, what's underneath there is their anxiety and their stress. So what's a way that I can speak to that in a way that will relieve it? while still talking about the same content, you know, not trying to um, give them solutions or fix it in a kind of superficial way, but a way to just kind of send, we'll find our way through it. What are we gonna do if the whole world falls apart? We're gonna look after each other. That's what we're gonna do. We'll look after each other, you know, and you're just kind of sending that vibe, even if they don't have the ears to hear it, the energy of that takes courage. It's much easier to just be like, yeah, and did you read this article? And did you read this article? You know, and you stir each other up, right? And then you're sucked into a whole afflictive state and they're in their afflictive state. And maybe there was a little bit of connection between you. So that was nice. But otherwise, you know, it's a bit of a wash. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, it's interesting what you said about laziness, because of course, laziness is why we don't practice a lot of the time, but where laziness comes from is self-cherishing, right? We wouldn't have laziness if we didn't have self-cherishing. I mean, it's just like um, certain kinds of eating badly doesn't feel like self-cherishing, but if you really want to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, you know you need to be healthy. And so it's a little bit self-cherishing to give yourself junk food. Yeah, it's like, it's saying, look, it's just me. It's my life. It's my body. It's not hurting anyone. It's just me. It's my life. It's my choice. You know, and you have these kind of like, it's not hurting anyone. But are you at your best if you're not healthy? And your best is what you want to offer others, you know? So self-cherishing is what says, have a snack instead of a proper meal. It's interesting because we don't frame it that way. It feels like self-soothing, you know? Be, be nice to yourself, give yourself a break, you know, when really it's like by doing yourself a disservice, then you're doing a disservice to all the people you're going to come into interaction with. It doesn't mean don't have ice cream ever. It just means name it correctly. Yeah, sometimes you need a moment of relief or you need a moment of samsaric indulgence to kind of like 
and then continue on your path, sure. But if it's your default everyday way of living and it's just your go-to habit, it's, it's something worth looking at, right? And you have to be so gentle because if you're too harsh with yourself, then there'll be the backlash and there'll be the inner rebellion that says, don't tell me what to do, I'll do what I like, even though you're the one telling yourself what to do. <laughs> you know, if you make it too hard, too quickly, um, you can have a bit of a backlash, like, um, you know, people doing eight numnes and then afterwards having a giant feast, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's not healthy. Um, but maybe they push themselves too hard and now they're having a reaction. It could happen, it can happen, yeah. So, you know, pacing is key. Self-awareness is key, but with all of it, you have to really flood your whole system with a bit of compassion for yourself, which means you see your own suffering and you see your ability to be free from that suffering, both simultaneously. And you wish yourself freedom from suffering and you know that freedom from suffering comes from practice. So, so you just kind of like take a minute and say, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing the trick a little bit with my practice, but there are definitely ways I could do deeper and more, but probably not as deep and more as my ego says. <laughs> you know, that's the tricky thing. So what's the deeper and more that is reasonable and practical at my level? And let's offer that to myself. And in offering that to myself, I'm offering a better self to others. Does it make sense? So, you know, practice is something you're offering yourself to give yourself happiness and freedom from suffering. And then that very self then becomes what you're offering other people. And then they get more and more the best of you. Yeah. Um, so any questions before we take a break for a cup of tea to rejuvenate? Is everyone feeling worried about your snack options in the break? You're like, oh no, I can't have that, that granola bar. I'm gonna have to have an apple. Oh, no. Venerable, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, uh, in difficult situations, when I think that it's my bad karma ripens, I feel that uh, nothing can be done to improve this situation now, that I can work only for the future, for the far away future, but now it's too late because it's karma ripens. What can be done with this thinking? Um, I mean, you, in one sense, you're quite right. You know, it, it's once karma is ripening, that particular seed needs to finish its potency and finish. So if we don't want negative karma to ripen, then we need to do purification, right? Um, but once it's ripened, there's so many things we can do to make it work for us. And that's the, it's totally the point of this text is to say, okay, it's ripening. How do I use it usefully? So the first thing that we learn, you know, in the sutra tradition, you know, especially in the middle scope and the small scope is how do I use the fact that I'm suffering and not hurt people because of it? How do I break that pattern of suffering leading to a negative state of mind? Right, there's suffering and then there's a the negative state of mind and they're not the same thing. So let's start by breaking that association that just because I'm in pain doesn't mean I get to be grumpy and take it out on my family, <laughs> right? I don't now have permission to be grumpy just because I'm in pain. They're two separate parts of the mind. Um, now, of course, you are gonna be grumpy when you're in pain to a certain degree. And you know, so knowing where you are is really important so you don't get this like self-punishing way of thinking about your path. So you think, all right, if it's a little headache, normally I'd let myself get grumpy, but actually I don't have to. I have enough mental strength to not hurt anyone, which means the potency of this headache is finishing and I'm not creating any new negative karma. And what's more, by thinking of how can I benefit others and not harm others, you're developing positive karma. Now, in the moment, you might think, yeah, but I still have a headache. What do I do about that? You can be thinking so many things, one of which is um, it can make you feel strong and brave to cope well. Coping well is empowering, but it, you have to notice yourself coping well. 
you know, when you cope well with bad, you know, with bad karma ripening, with hardships, with suffering, but you notice yourself coping well, it gives you some like fortitude, some inner strength that realizes you're stronger than you remembered. And actually you can get even stronger still. So even in the moment, there can be kind of an inner satisfaction and joy together with, I don't want this headache, you know, or I don't want this communication breakdown that's happened between me and my friend, or I don't want this environmental breakdown that's happening all around me. I don't want this. I don't want this. Instead of thinking, I don't want this, think this is useful. This is useful. I don't know. I don't know if that helps, but there's, you know, there's the couple tiered strategy. One is let the karma finish and don't create any more of the same. So don't hurt anyone. <laughs> the next is even in this moment, it can help me access the human condition and understand the suffering of others. And that is useful information I need as an aspiring bodhisattva. I need to understand suffering well in order to connect with other people. So this is useful. And you know, the other is now I can really use this as a reminder of why I need to stop creating negative karma. Cause I don't like this. I don't like this suffering. So I need to stop doing this to myself and for the benefit of others. So, so there's a lot of, you know, kind of levels to look at your current experience, but to know that your current experience is always something useful for the path. It's just knowing what is the access point, you know, in terms of the teachings, it's actually going to land with your heart. Yeah. So slowly, slowly, um, We'll, um, we'll have a little half hour break.